I didn't it? <clears throat> Before Jeff comes up here and the rest of the band, I just want to take a few minutes because this is uh, this first part of October. Some of you are going to be heading to the field to uh, do some hunting and things like that. And we just wanted to recognize all the sports that we got. I uh, was hoping that Larry Watley would be here, but I think he's out uh, today. But all the people that are sportsmen and sportswomen that are going to be going to the field, we just want to recognize you. We want to have a prayer here in a, a, just a minute for your safety and that you'll fill all your tags because that's, that's what it's about, isn't it? So let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Dear Lord, thank you, Father, for today. Thank you for the country that we live in. And, Lord, for the way that the game is managed. I pray, Lord, that uh, the tags that are out there, that they will be filled, that all the people that are in the field, that they will have safety. And, Lord, you'll just watch over the whole operation that we may uh, take advantage of the things, the natural resources that you've put out there for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, we want to sing you a song that's uh, it's entitled, Busy Man. <clears throat> I went hunting cause I needed some meat for the pot. I saw a bush move, so I took a little shot. Now I'm running through the forest and I gotta move fast. If I take a little breast, it's gonna be my last. The briars and the bushes are slapping in my face. I'm a stump jumping boy and I'm in for the race. I can't afford to lose. I got a brand new trail. Cause I shot a black bear where I used to have a tail. I've snapped in a trap and it won't let go. The game warden's coming. I can see him down the road. Got a fish on the line, a turkey in my hand. For the next few minutes, I'll be a busy man. I went down to the river to run my line. Thought I'd catch a fish about supper time. I tied my boat to a sunken log. Now I'm headed down the river like an old hound dog. <clears throat> well, the sun is a setting and I'm still going strong. I wonder if I'm ever going to get back home. If you hear something coming down the river with a yell, that's me, I'm tied to an alligator tail. I've snapped in a trap and it won't let go. The game warden's coming, I can see him down the road. Got a fish on the line, a turkey in my hand. For the next few minutes, I'll be a busy man. For the next few minutes, I'll be a busy man. Y'all be safe out there. Thank you, Buford and Emery. <laughs> We're going to get started here. Get all my, all my apparel on. It's good to see you all again. I've been gone for a couple weeks. I've been over at the other service helping out over there with some sound. And I think it's working now. Yeah. 
Anyway, though, it's always good back to see all you guys again. Um, we're depleted a little bit as a group. Uh, hopefully we'll have Bob back next week, but yeah. we're going to make the best of it we can. We're going to turn to page 13, and we're going to try do, Lord. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Way beyond the blue. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord. Oh, do Lord, oh, do remember me way beyond the blue. How about it, David? again, do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me, do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me, do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me, way beyond the blue, way beyond the blue. I'll tell you something, when you lay off for a couple of weeks, oh, and I don't play the guitar in at home, the only time I do it's here. My fingers feel like they're asleep right now. <laughs> I probably should have got out and practiced a little bit along the way. Yeah. <laughs> How many years? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to turn. Bob, Bob, yeah, talking about my age, yeah. Uh, page 31 we're going to go to, In the Garden. The dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and He walks with me. With me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever. birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me 
within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we sing this without any music. You go on, turn the chorus. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tell Good job, y'all. Yeah. Uh, normally, we kind of get Larry Whiteley up here right now, but this is going to be... Are you Larry Jr. today? I am, I am Larry Whiteley. I've been using a new face cream, and it works working wonderfully. Well, I don't know. I think I'd ask for my money back. Oh. <laughs> yeah, really? Doing the best day of life, Tell you who your friends are when you get on stage, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, welcome home to Sac River Cowboy Church. Good to see everybody this morning. Any visitors this morning? All family? Oh, nope, right over there. Good, okay. Well, that means we leave the snakes in the box. Uh, so we appreciate that. All right, any others? Okay, how about any birthdays? Awesome. Oh, yep, yep, oh. yep, yep, yep. Got them all over the place. Awesome, too. 20? Uh, 26. 26. Oh, you're carrying oh, it well. Goodness. Carrying it well. Boy, by the time you're 100, you won't look 50. Jeff, can we use the snakes for the potluck? No. Please. No, no, no. They've already started that. <laughs> oh, no. All right. Anniversaries. <laughs> no anniversary. Oh, yeah, we do have an anniversary. So, All right. That means we're, all, we're singing all of it. Dawson, you got this? You're going to have to sing yourself this time. You got, uh, uh, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to me. I mean, you. Well, you know what I mean. Was it your birthday, too? No, it wasn't my You're birthday. You're confusing me, man. I go to Willie. <laughs> Isn't there a song that says it's your birthday? It's my birthday, too? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> All right. And a one, and a two, and a one, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy birthday and anniversary. Happy birthday and anniversary to you. And to Dawson. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see here. We had some pictures from baptism. I don't know whether they got brought over from first and second. I'd say that's a no. What's that? Okay. I don't know about the pictures. Um, we, we do have some pictures from the baptism. If you've got, if you um, um, were baptized at, um, at the creek, um, there's pictures available. Um, come see me. I'll see what I can do to get them to you. I don't have them with me, but uh, if you're looking for them, so Boy, keep on going. okay, just keep on talking. All right, <laughs> all right. You can check out the Bunkhouse Gazette, um, Band of Brothers, Circle of Sisters, Line Dancing. I mean, Scotty was talking about our line dancing. When we go shopping for boots, we have to buy two pair. We both we need the left feet. So, <laughs> just saying. All right. This is not in your bunkhouse gazette. Uh, October 31st, we're going to have a trunk or treat uh, for the kids. Um, okay, so when you bring your bag, bring it full of candy so that you can give it away. Don't come to get candy, okay? But, it, but, but if you're a kid, yes, 
if you're if you're grown up, bring some candy. Try to keep it prepackaged uh, with all the stuff that's going on, and and uh, so I mean, I'd re- me personally, I'd rather have the homemade goodies, but probably ought to just stick with the with the um, uh, the prepackaged stuff. You can decorate your car. That'll be from six to eight on October thirty first, and that'll give us uh, a chance to give the kids a place to uh, trick or treat in a safe environment. So that that's a good thing. Um, let's see, what else do we have? They're already eating potluck at second service, and that's where the snakes went, David. Yep, okay. So, all right. Um, just a reminder, second service's new start time is 10 o'clock, and the reason for that is so that we can uh, facilitate children's church a little better with the workers that we have. And uh, so uh, just remember, it's not about us. It's about bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and those kids need the gospel. So... So um, um, that's, that's the reason for that change. So be patient with us. We've got a few bugs, but we'll have to work them out. Um, let's see here. Also, we have um, 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 like the high schoolers. Um, so actually, I'm going to put the 7th through 12th grade in there. Uh, meeting here, or actually at the new building, at uh, 6 o'clock, and they're having food. I don't know. Do you guys do you go to that, Dawson? Uh, Okay, okay. They had um, tacos, I think, last week. I'm, I'm not sure what they're having this week, but din- dinner's at 6, and then 7, seven o'clock they've got uh, a service and, and some things to, some fun things to do for the, for the teenagers. All right, since Larry's got something to think about, I can't steal his thunder. So I'm going to call mine Catfish on the Line, okay? <laughs> okay, with that being said, I do have uh, some sad news. As most of you know, Ron Rust went home to be with the Lord this past week. Um, we are going to miss Ron on this side of heaven. They must have needed a, a, a wonderful saxophone player, and they got one. And um, Ron was the real deal. Um, when folks like Ron go to heaven, yes, it stings just like, just, just, just like I, I actually had two mu- musician friends go home to be with the Lord in this past two weeks. And um, um, it stings, but they both left a forwarding address. And so um, when, when Jesus has your friends, everything's okay. We'll see them soon enough. Okay. All right. Let's see here. All right. Most of us know what it means. Here's the, here's the something to think about catfish on the line thing. Most of us know what it means to be stunned by a sudden passing of a dedicated friend or maybe a godly pastor, devout missionary, or a saintly mother. We've all stood at an open grave with hot tears running down our cheeks. And we've asked in utter bewilderment, God, why? It's just something that we do. Because we know the impact that these people had made and can't help but think of the good that they could continue to do if they would have just lived a little longer. But the death of a righteous person is no accident. Do you think that God, whose watchful visual notes the sparrow's fall, He knows the numbers of hairs on our head would turn his back on one of his children in this hour of peril. See, with God, there's no accidents. There's no catastrophes. There's no tragedies. Because as far as God is concerned, he has his children in the palm of his hands. He loves us and he cares about us. It was Sir Walter Scott who asked, is death the last sleep? Then he answers his own question and says, no, it's the final awakening. And when you think about that, isn't that awesome? There's no more sleep. It's it's all about the awakening. And this is true for every believer in Jesus Christ. Because even when we grieve, or even when grief overwhelms us, or confusion assails us, we can still trust trust God's all-knowing love. When we are grieving the loss of a loved one, We are never alone. Our Heavenly Father understands our sadness. The shortest verse in the Bible says Jesus wept. It wasn't because he he was, because Lazarus had died. He already knew where Lazarus was at. Jesus felt compassion on his friends and his family and saw their hurt. So remember, we can find joy that God has a wonderful eternity planned for each believer. Isn't that awesome? So... All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, um, um, we've had a few stings this past week, and, and uh, God, we know that you are still on the throne. We know that there are no accidents. We know that there are no tragedies. 
that, that they seem like it to us, but we know that you are on the throne and that you have a wonderful plan for every believer that comes home and every believer that is going to come home. Father, we just love you and just ask God that everything that we say and do here today lifts up your wonderful son, Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All right. You go. We've got a few specials to do this morning, and we're going to get started on them right now. Addo is going to come up and do one in respect for Ron. Do you have something you want to say, too? Yeah. Me and Ron, we're going to play this together, and it didn't happen, so I'm going to play Hallelujah. Buford Emory. That's pretty special stuff. Yeah. We got a little bit more special music. Um, I am going to go ahead and just warn you guys. Um, Buford and Emory are going to do one at the end of their special. We've got one more, and it's going to be our brother Ron playing one last special. It's one we had recorded of him. Um, the guy was such a phenomenal yes. musician and a Christian, just a way to live a life. Uh, anyway, we wanted to honor him with one last song, too. us today samantha my granddaughter she's going to be singing some uh, uh, harmony on this song take us just a minute here to <clears throat> buford and i we like comedy we we dish it up we take it. The reason we do that is because we have the peace of God and we know that this life is just a prelude to a, a life that we cannot fathom. And it's coming soon. And <clears throat> I can't help with this many people here, I can't help but think that there might be somebody that enjoys the service comes every week, but somehow the personal relationship with Jesus Christ you've missed, and it has to be that way. Nobody gets to heaven because of their mamas or daddies or grandmothers or, or grandfathers. Nobody gets to heaven because of uh, how many times they went to church or anything like that, how many people 
they've been kind to. You get to heaven because you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You have a relationship with Him. And if that's the case, this song is straight up for you because we want you to change that today. <clears throat> Are you a stranger to God, carried away with your strife pride? Tell me, friend, do you ever stop and think? Are you afraid to die? Are you afraid? Are you unsaved? Are you afraid to die? Call on him while he is near. Moments are swift passing by. Will you seek him while he still may be found? Are you afraid to Anyway, like I was saying a while ago, uh, Ron always blessed us with a lot of songs um, that he would do solos on. Always very impressive, and we're going to um, honor him with one last special. If I can get it to come up. Uh, You know, there's a song, uh, I think I've done it here before, but it, it talks about it 
talks about when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. And, uh, and the song says, he knew me, yet he still loved me. You know, the mess that we are, the mess that I am, all the things I've done wrong, he still loves me. And when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Ronnie, we'll see you soon. You're failing today. This is a sad day for us. Glad day for Ronnie, but a sad day for us. <clears throat> He's in heaven, but we're not yet. 
<clears throat> Today we are going to gather together to do a very unique thing. We've only done one other time in the history of the, of the Cowboy Church, and that's we're going to ordain a pastor today. And that's, uh, let's welcome Mr. and Mrs. Jeff Bryant. Welcome them. And right now, will you please stand up, guys, and take a bow? <clears throat> we'll be doing that today. Boy, when old Ronnie would play that, that horn... Uh, I mean, you just could feel the love of God and power of God flowing through that horn. And when a church, a church works so good when everybody brings their gifts and, and uses them in the church. And Ronnie brought his gift, and, and, and you bring your gift, and you bring your gift, and we all bring our gift and use it. And when we do, man, things work wonderfully well in the, in the kingdom of God. Today, we're going to focus on the gift of leadership, to be specific we want to be considering the pastorate. I'd like for just before I start to, to say, if you are considering going into the pastorate, there's never been a time in the history of the church that it was more advantageous for you to do so. We need more pastors in, in church work. Uh, if you have any call on your life, if God has called you to do this and you've pushed it back for years and years and years, I want to ask you to reconsider and to step up and let God use you today because this is a time when churches are having trouble finding pastors. They're not, they're, we're not completely without, but it's becoming very, very hard to find pastors today. And if God's calling you, there's a reason, and He has a purpose for it. Paul is going to write in our study today in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul is going to write a letter to, to the young Timothy, his protege, uh, young Timothy, and he's going to write to encourage him and inform him about uh, church leadership about what to do, how to, uh, what to avoid, the lifestyle, uh, characteristic traits, etc. <clears throat> it has always been my, my idea, my thought, that poor leadership destroys a church's chance to thrive. It, it, I believe that any church, in any situation, wherever God's people are gathered, can thrive and do exactly what God put them there to do. If everybody brings their gift and everybody uses their gift freely and lovingly and generously in that body, that church can thrive. What I have noticed is that a pastor can, can keep a church from thriving or let one thrive. And so when a pastor gets out of the way and lets a church do what God called it to do, that church can thrive. So bring your gift and help us to find good leadership uh, that will hold up good biblical models for us to follow. <clears throat> the, there are special characteristic traits, character traits, and lifestyle choices uh, of a biblical pastor, and uh, we want to look at them today. We want to look at those, those characteristics and those biblical traits uh, just in brief. We're going to be reading from 1 Timothy chapter 3. So if you have a Bible or would like to follow along, I will read it the best I can. And uh, you listen it if you don't have a Bible. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of bishop, he desires a good work. Now let's stop a moment. The word bishop is... Uh, uh, it's translated from a Greek word, all right? But uh, in the early church days, by the time this was written, the, there was uh, a, a general consensus idea of the one who led a church, that was, and the word is overseer or, or bishop, it, however you want to translate it. It's still, that's neither, neither of those words reflect the Greek word. But there was someone who, it, and <clears throat> the problem here is we're coming from the synagogue, into church. We're thinking, we're transitioning people from Jewish uh, traditions to the new Christian traditions that are forming. The idea of a, a, a pastor like we have in the 21st century was totally a different thing back then. So you had overseers. Now, there were, that's not to say there weren't pastors. Of course, there were. James was a pastor of the church in Jerusalem, Jesus, Jesus' half brother. He was a pastor. So there were pastors. But this article that Paul wrote to Timothy having to do, has to do with church leadership. So again, if a man desires the position of bishop, he desires a good thing. So get that right up front. It's a good thing. 
to be a pastor. It's a good thing to seek that career choice. And so if God is calling you, please be aware it is important that you step in. And it's a good thing. Now keep going. A bishop, a bishop then sh- must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, I'd like to drill down in those just a little. I'd like to spend just a little time with each of those character traits and requirements for the pastorate, and I'll, because I'm going to expand them a little bit. First of all, he must be above reproach. That means he's blameless. Now, before you get nervous about that, be aware that there are no such thing as blameless people, all right? Uh, even though you think I am, I'm not. I mean, I, I live such a perfect life, I'm sure that everybody, no, I'm joking, of course. <clears throat> but what it means by living above reproach, that simply means that if somebody were to accuse you of something or throw uh, mud at you, it won't stick. In other words, your life has been lived in such such a way that even if you're accused, people say, oh, that's not true. That didn't happen. Somebody's making that up. Because your life has balanced out over the, over the time that, that you don't do that or you don't act like that or you don't say that. So the, the accusation won't stick to you. Now, if you're going to lead a church, you will be accused of something down the road. Just plan on it. But the pastor who is above reproach is one that will, the, the accusations won't stick. We do, however, live under grace and not law. Are you aware of that? We're under grace. And so the, give, give grace as well as receiving it. Now, a shady character, someone whose characteristics are shady, and they're always in and out of the trouble with neighbors and the law and, and uh, all that kind of problems that happen among us, somebody that's doing that all the time, you might want to try another career choice other than pastor, okay? That's probably not going to be good for you. You're going to need one that's a, a little bit different. And I don't want to pick on anybody, you know, I don't know, sell cars or insurance or, you know, uh, do something. <laughs> now, some of the best people I know in the world sell cars and insurance, all right? So I'm, in, I'm not saying anything here. Just, uh, yeah, just just do something else. Don't be in the pasture. Now, uh, he's supposed to be the husband of one wife. He's got to be, the pastor needs to be faithful to his wife. <clears throat> he, in other words, he doesn't go around flirting with everybody all the time. <clears throat> and uh, uh, with other women, he's a, th- the best way to translate this, and I've done, I spent hours looking into this word, husband of one wife. <clears throat> and I think the best definition I've ever heard is, he is a one-woman kind of man. He's a one-woman kind of man. In other words, he, he, that's kind of, you look at him, well, yeah, he's, yeah that's, he has a wife, and he stays with her. One-woman kind of man. All right, let's leave it at that. Husband of one wife. Self-control. He's temperate. In other words, he's the master of his own behavior. His behavior doesn't master him. He masters his behavior. He controls it. He's temperate. He has a, a godly filter on his conversation. Have you noticed that when people get older like me, their filters go to leaking? You notice that? And, when, and we, say, we say things we wouldn't have said earlier and younger. We, you know, I don't know. What is the deal on us? Why, did, why that happens? But, and not just older people, but we all have a filter that we put on our language, our conversation. And a pastor has to have a good filter. He cannot really say what's what he thinks all the time. Amen? Now, I guess it, you can't help thinking it, but you've got to watch not saying it. <clears throat> Godly filters. He thinks about how his behavior affects others. So it's selflessness. So a pastor has to be selfless, not selfish, because 
He can't just do anything he wants to do anytime. A pastor has to think how that impacts, affects other people. And one, another time that this is discussed in the Bible, it's called he must walk circumspectly. Now, that simply is defined as walking in a circle, looking at carefully at the circle that you're walking in, circumspect, and you're making sure you're not stepping on anybody, hurting anybody, kicking anybody. He's, he's careful about his life. Well, that's, that's what it means there. Now, he also has to be, he has to be sober-minded, or he, he lives wisely. He makes good choices. Uh, you know, he's going to make a bad choice once in a while. Everybody does. But over a lifetime, his choices are good. He makes good choices. Then he has a good reputation. Uh, of good behavior, but a good reputation. Now, get this, in the church and outside of the church, if if the community at large does not think the pastor has a, a good reputation, he will not be able to attract people to the Lord. Uh, the, he will not have an audience where he can speak to them. They'll just turn him off, tune him out. But if a person, a pastor, is living with a good reputation, the church thinks highly of him outside and out, inside and outside, the, then he is has a good reputation. He's respected. Then a pastor needs to be hospitable. He must be one that, uh, well, in the ancient world, it would be to open your home, house, open your house, because they didn't have motels and uh, hotels. So when you traveled, you, you stayed with people. And the pastor probably would be one of the first places in town that a stranger would go to. Can I stay with you? And he had to be hospitable. But today, that's not the case, is it? Uh, we don't go staying with, with other people because we have uh, motels and we have fast cars. That we don't have to be gone. We can go in and come back or if we're not going to stay. Not. Anyway, the, the long story is we don't just stay with other people. So there must be another application, and there, and there is. He must, a person, I think, who is hospitable is one that is open and willing to socialize with everyone, to not be selective, not have a click. Or, or just his favorite people. He wants to t just talk with his favorite people. Not every, everyone. But the truth is, a pastor cannot have a, a social clique within the church. He's got to be everybody's pastor, not just a few. He's got to love everyone and not just the, the rich or the pretty. He's got to love everybody. And that's so important, I believe, in our world today. Some pastors are, by nature, introverted. That means... They look, they're always inside. And that's good. Most scholars, most thinkers that study the, the Bible, and they spend lots of time alone. And so some pastors are introverted. But the pastor has to balance that. Even if you are an introvert, you've got to be comfortable with people and be glad to be around people and talk with everyone. So here's the thing. It says he, he has ha apt to teach. So it's good. You must have insights into the Word of God. You must be a student, but that's not where it stops. You have to be able to communicate the truths to people. Have you ever heard a pastor preach that just finished his Ph.D.? And he will use words he learned in seminary, and he will, you know, he'll eschatology, and he'll, uh, he will do all these syroinformatic crises, and he'll throw all these theological concepts with at you and you're sitting here punching your wife and, or your husband saying what's he talking about or you get in the car going home and say, i didn't get a bit of that well a pastor has to be able to put information teaching application down on a low shelf if the pastor keeps application and truth on a high shelf just the elite you know the erudite the smart the the educated, they'll, maybe a few of them will get it. Uh, but the truth is, we've got to keep it, keep it down on a low level. <laughs> One time I pastored a church that ha it seemed like half the men in it were PhDs and, and all. And um, I never could figure out why they came to the church I pastored. But they came, and, and uh, I was telling someone one time, I said, man, I'm intimidated preaching to all those doctors. I said, preach the Bible. They never read that. No, no, I got it. Yeah, yeah, that works so good. So, <clears throat> gifted insights, but able to teach, communicates it well. 
Then he shouldn't be addicted to wine, never gets drunk or overindulges in alcohol. And he also needs, I think we've got to add more to this today, because what about drugs? You know, same thing, uh, substance abuse and those sort of issues. Uh, a guy should be, have that under control and not be addicted to it in any way. My favorite story, I've told this all my life, when I've always preached on addicted to wine and other substances like that, uh, I have to be careful here with because um, hypocrisy is a bad word too and a bad thing we don't want to do. Uh, you all got this picture of the 350-so pound preacher. You with me? He's got on a black suit. He can't quite get the buttons together, and but he's preaching. He's He's got on... Uh, and he's walking around up on the stage, and he's screaming at the top of his lungs. His face is red, and he's talked for about 30 minutes. He's talked about drinking, and he's killing himself with a fork the whole time. You with me? And what kind of a witness is he to the world? He spends all his time talking about your sin, not his. Okay? So it's important here that we be very careful about hypocrisy, because if we're not careful, we'll move into that. So... He should not be violent. He resolves conflict peacefully. He has a person that approaches a situation and brings peace instead of heightens the problem. When you're in a church or in a business or in a, a family, <clears throat> you need to think about this. Every one of you have two buckets, and you're holding one in each hand. One bucket has water in it. The other bucket has gasoline. Now, you're going through life, you're going through church, and you come on a situation, and there's a little fire burning there. Ooh, somebody's mad. You have a choice. You can throw water, or you can throw gasoline. A pastor needs to be a water thrower. That's his approach. He needs to put fires out, not make fires worse. Are we communicating? <clears throat> he resolves conflict peacefully. He's gentle. His manner and words are not abrasive. Uh, someone summarized this by saying he has a good bedside manner. And it's important that a pastor has that, that he can talk to people and calm nerves and calm pain and grief has a good bedside manner. He loves peace. He works toward peace in every situation. He looks, that's what he's working for, is to get peace. And quite honestly, there is nothing more important in a church than, to, than a church at peace. A church at peace can grow, can thrive, but a church that's in turmoil, it cannot do that. And then a pastor is not to love money. He understands the place of money in his life. He understands how important it is, but he understands the position it's to take. I, I've been doing this a long time. I've dealt with pulpit pastor search committees or pulpit committees from a long time, even from Halltown, Alice. Remember, <laughs> back in those days, 100 years ago, we, we dealt with pulpit committees and, and through the years. And always I would tell every committee I've ever dealt with, I'd say, money is not first with me, but it's second. You with me? I made sure they understood that because I don't want to lie to them. Money is important. You, you know, you, your wife's going to want to know what she's going to live on. And so money is important, so it's, don't throw it out the window. But it's not first. Money should not be first with a pastor. He needs to know where it is. And he manages home well, his own home well. He takes care of things. His family and his home are in order. They're not in chaos. His life is, is ordered. His children are polite and respectful. I hope you don't hold me to that through the year. Because I've had my grandkids here from time to time, and they've not, they're not always respectful or polite, but his finances are in order. In other words, not a new Christian. He's proven through his life and experience and through the years that he is a faithful follower of Jesus, that it will able to face the storms that come because he's been through a few storms. He's not a new Christian. Well, those are the things that Paul told Timothy in that letter there in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, I'm going to pass that on to you as a congregation, as a church. Now, let me ask Julie and Jeff, if they would, please, to come to the front of the church. And I'm going to ask you to stand right down here, if you please. <clears throat> and I'm going to hand the microphone down to Jeff. And I want him to give us his testimony. 
Tell us about being saved and about your call to preach. All right. Well, I've told this twice. I'm hoping I've got it down pat now. When I was, uh, I, I grew up in church, and um, um, I, I had a drug problem when I was a little kid. My mom and dad drugged me to church every time they could. When I was about nine years old, I, I come to the understanding, though, that uh, when, when the preacher would preach that I didn't want to go to hell. That's not someplace I wanted to go. And so I had, I had the knowledge of God, and I had a belief that there was a God. And I, I, I went down front, and, and um, um, I, I, I told the preacher, you know, I didn't want to go to hell. And, and so I got, I, I, I got baptized after that. But, you know, there was a, as, as my life went along, knowing who God is and believing who God is, it's not enough. That's, that's not what it's all about. Um, you have to have trust in the Lord. You have to give Him your life and trust Him with it. And, I, and, and so I had doubts hanging around my, my, my salvation. And so when I was about 31... I went out in the car, cold November morning, didn't even start the car, and I prayed to the Lord to take that doubt away. And I understood at that particular time that, that I had to give him everything. I had to trust him with all of my life, not just part of it. If he was playing Texas Hold'em, you'd say, I'm all in. I'm all in. And that's... That's what I did that day. I, I, I gave my life to Christ all in, fully trusted him. And I've, I've not looked back since. Now, about a year and a half ago, the um, Lord started working on me. And, and, and in my spirit life, in my spiritual life, everything was starting, got, got very amplified. That's, that's the only way I can, I can explain it. I was... I was uh, um, God was showing me messages, and I had this urgency about telling others about Christ that I'd never had before. A boldness that I didn't care what other people thought. They had to know about Jesus. And that time is running, ticking pretty fast. And so with that, I went in, and I knew God was calling me. And I went to my wife, and said, honey, I think the Lord's calling me. Well, she wasn't having any of that. She wasn't on board. Um, and I don't, you know, I had a lot of, uh, it was, it's pretty scary. It's pretty scary when God calls you to the ministry. But she, she was, she was and, I, and I said, Lord, I, I don't, I know that what you're telling me, and, but you're going to have to show her. You're going to have to show her. I'm not going to push. I'm not going to. I'm not going to say any more about it. It's in your hands, Lord, because I can't fight two fronts. You can't fight home and fight the devil at the same time. You got to. It's got to be all one thing. And so she comes up to me about three weeks later, and she says, "Honey, you know, when you was talking about that being called," and I said, "Yeah." She says, "I believe that you were." So what God had done, he had taken the fleece. You remember in the Old Testament how they'd take the fleece, which was a, a sheepskin that had smooth side on one side and a fuzzy side on the other. And they would lay it out there and they say, Lord, have the dew be on the top of this fleece. And so they'd go out the next morning and, and, and what they were doing, they were looking for answers from God. And they'd find the, the dew was on the top of the fleece, but they wanted to make sure some... Maybe they'd shake it off, and they'd flip it over, and they'd say, Lord, this time put it on the bottom side. And then they'd go out, and the fleece was on, the dew was on the bottom side. So that's kind of what God was doing with us, was he was, we, he was, we were putting out the fleece, and he was answering. And I must have had, if I had one person, I had seven or eight come up to me in the next three weeks, says, have you been called to preach? One of them was Scotty. I told him no. <laughs> it's true. You did. I did. I told him no. I knew different. But the thought of it was kind of scary. 
But there was a scarier thought. See, I read the book of Jonah, and, and he was a guy that ran from God. I'm in the boat a lot. And so the thought of a big catfish eating me and dragging me down the river for three days wasn't very high on my list. But the point is that, that when God calls you to do something, you can't run from it. It's not wise. And, and, and honestly, we got to trust God to take care of it anyway. That's where our trust lies. And so I have no doubt that God called me to preach the gospel because I, when I asked him, I says, but God, I'm old. You didn't do it when I was younger. And he says, you know what? Moses was 80. Why don't you just shut up? <laughs> and so I said, okay. And Julie said, okay. And uh, we, we've started a journey. And I, I could go on about how the, pla- the, the path that he has plowed would just absolutely blow your mind. It sure has blown mine. But I'm going to give God everything I've got left. I didn't start when I was 18 like I wish I had, of, but he's going to get what I got left. And that's, that's my testimony. You accept Jeff's testimony this morning. Jeff, will you be faithful to the teachings of the Bible? Absolutely. And teach us the Bible. Will you serve people as pastor in love and in faithfulness? Yes. Will you live a life of faithfulness as an example to this church? Yes. Jeff has answered those well. He said yes to each one of them. Now I want to ask you some questions, congregation. You're on the spot now. Will you serve and support the pastor both financially and spiritually? It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple? And those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. What that means is uh, Jeff has chosen this as a career path for him. This is what he's going to do now to feed his family. And so he, I just want you to know what he's done is a biblical thing. It's a good thing. It's a biblical thing. And you as a congregation uh, are responsible now to support that in all those, in the ways we talked about. Congregation, will you pray for God's blessings on Jeff and his ministry? Congregation, will you not give up on him when he makes a few normal bad mistakes? I'll try to keep them to a minimum. Yeah. No, I didn't There'll hear much from you. There'll be will one you, or two. Well, I didn't hear much. Will you support him even when he makes mistakes? Okay. Will you love him and follow him as he grows and makes difficult church decisions? Yes or no? Thank you. We're going to lay hands on Jeff and ordain him to the gospel ministry. Who's going to do that? You are. We want you, as many as you, of you who can, to come at this time, lay your hands on Jeff, and we're going to ordain him by having an ordaining prayer. Uh, I've got two. I'm going to have Johnny say one. Johnny's going to leave. And Jeff Grant's one. And Jeff Grant. We're going to have two ordaining prayers. So come this way. Not everybody will be able to touch him, but you can touch somebody who's touching him. And and, uh, let's do this. As many of us care to come and join us in this prayer of ordination. Two and a half years ago, we was at the Cowboy Church and had the old tears just rolling down my eyes. Old catfish says, why don't we just pray? Well, you know what? He did a really good job. And uh, I'm reading the old Bible verse here this morning. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God. 
to those who are called according to his purpose. Well, what a purpose it is to have him here and to be able to be here. And Lord, we thank you so much to have a Philadelphia church as we've been taught what that is and to be able to be a part of it and to guide him in teaching the truth. There are so many false prophets out here today and Lord, we thank you for all that you've given us and your love and blessings and keep this Philadelphia church blessed. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you in um, great happiness, rejoicing in the fact that we know that Jeff has answered your calling. Probably not an easy one, but we ask that you fill his heart with love and understanding for the Bible, the church. Let his light shine, your light, through him. Let it all come together. We want to thank you for his grandparents, his parents, his wife, Julie, teachers, mentors like Scotty, who have came in and guided him, godly people who have made a difference in his life, his children. We know that all these things were moving him to this point. Heavenly Father, we just ask that everything he does is through your love. And I will close with that. Amen. Jeff, you are now officially an ordained pastor. Three times over. <laughs> Jeff, we want you to lead us to become the church God has dreamed for this church to be. We want you to teach us the word of God by, by word and by action. And we want you to love us when we're not very lovely. And we want you to pray for us without ceasing. Let me pray a prayer of benediction. When, after I finish praying this prayer, we have ordination papers here that we would like to ask each of you to sign on the back of, one of them is already full, so the other is just a blank sheet of paper. We'd like for you to continue signing that so that we'll have a record then of who's here today. And I'll just leave this right here with you. And you, do, and you take it then after it's over. Father, dismiss us with your blessing. Let your light shine upon Jeff and Julie as they walk down this glorious but difficult path that they've chosen, that you've called him to walk down. Be with him, guard him, keep the hand of the enemy away from him. And that's our prayer in Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.